let's get at it here. So uh, I want to, this is, uh, I'm gonna set up the six problems that are on your celebration that's graded. Uh, talk about the, that setup a bit more, but leave uh, the work to you. Uh, and time permitting, we'll also uh, do, I'll do some other problems that are uh, like these, uh, typically harder than these, um, but involving many of the same steps. So I um, want to, um, let me get my colors set up here. So let's take a few things here. So uh, the first five meters of this journey is a spring. So we're imagining on this aircraft carrier problem, there's a huge spring launcher uh, to launch these airplanes off of the runway, which is essentially what it is. Uh, there are some catapult cables that launch them off it and uh, a bit more efficient than a humongous spring uh, and then we have some uh, a 21 meter long runway uh, uh, that this thing goes down these planes are a couple thousand kilograms and need to have a velocity of 45 meters per second by the end of the runway. So I want to know what would the spring constant be uh, for this launcher. So the to be consistent with a lot of the lecture material uh, th that we that you took notes on, I'm going to use the energy pie charts as a way to set up the problem. And so in the initial part of the problem, we have some spring energy and we have some work done by thrust. So I'm gonna put WT. So whether it's half and half is not the issue. Hopefully you remember that from the lecture. Just splitting up the pi in as many pieces as there are energy involved in, in the thing. And then that all that goes into kinetic energy at the end of the, which we normally just write with a K, uh, at the end of the runway or once it's uh, uh, past the spring part of the, the, the puzzle here, all right? So the pie charts are just an organizational tool that let you picture in a, in a semi-quantitative way, kind of qualitative a bit, a bit too, because we're not trying to be exact with the portions. Uh, you'd have to do some computations to, to know that, and that's not particularly useful uh, in that regard. So how do we uh, measure this? So the U, capital U is a symbol for potential energy. Sub S is a spring and uh, from the reading and lecturing, we know that the potential energy stored in a spring is one half Kx squared, where K is that spring constant. The work done by the thrust is just gonna be force times distance. Work is always a force times distance. And then, so that's the initial, that's the gozenta part of the problem, okay? And that's gonna equal, in the end, the kinetic energy. And so the ability to write an energy balance is the main event in these problems. And if you can write an energy balance, then it's a matter of solving for something. You may have to go and find a value or find a way to substitute something away, but it becomes a math problem. So at this point, the physics is technically done. We've done an energy balance, and the rest of this story uh, is going to be a math problem, all right? And so just to uh, connect some dots here, so you know the first five meters you know, is the spring part of the, the spring is pushing. So you wanna, you know, I'm gonna match up the colors, you know, here with the highlighting. And uh, 
uh, we, um, the 21 meter long runway, well, that's the length over which that force, that thrust force is acting, okay? Um, we have uh, the mass of the plane, and uh, we're gonna need a velocity. Um, uh, oh, and I forgot, I left the thrust out. Thrust of um, those meters. And so with the highlighting, you can see that all that's left that we don't know is the case. So that literally is a math problem. So if you take this approach, uh, you can very quickly know if there's more information that needs to be um, got, so to speak. So I'll leave the rest to you and uh, we'll move on to uh, this next one. So uh, this uh, No problem. All right, so the, this fish. So there's this fish that shoots water at insects to knock them off their branches, their leaves, their twigs, whatever they're on, and then it eats them, which is uh, an interesting uh, thing here. And so this fish, it will shoot water at insect, uh, a little jet that's 14 feet per second. And so you're watching this. Uh, it's about a foot and a half above the stream. And so what angle from the horizontal can this be ejected uh, to hit the moth? And so because you're a physics nerd, you think about it. And so here we have the fact that the kinetic energy ends up, in fact, the, the kinetic energy I'm going to do an unconventional thing. I've never seen anybody do this in a textbook, but I've also never seen anybody use pie charts uh, in a textbook. So initially, there is this kinetic energy of the water jet that this fish is is uh, dealing with. And that uh, kinetic energy is gonna be in balance with uh, the gravitational potential energy uh, that's stored in this system, okay? And so that energy is going to, uh, that water jet has to go up and it has to beat gravity. And so these have to be in balance uh, here. And so if I write it this way, instead of V naught squared, so there'll be some initial um, amount of energy, since I'm talking about the up direction, which we don't normally do uh, with energy, I'll say V naught in the Y direction, because this gets me into a place where I can get an angle. There's another way to do this that I'm not going to show um, because it's not an energy method, uh, at least not directly. And so now we have a situation, and by the way, in this problem, little g is a 32.2 feet per second per second because it's all feet and and, and feet per second and whatnot. And this V naught Y business, if you go back to, um, you know, uh, chapter four of my textbook, and I'm not sure, it's chapter three or four, I think, in uh, the other textbook, OpenStax, uh, this component thing about velocity and this will allow you to get a trigonometric thing out of it because it's a component y direction. And so uh, chose kinetic energy up because the work done by gravity is down. So these are collinear, but I really chose it because 
I need an angle. And so uh, a component in the y direction uh, gives me a tool to extract an angle from the problem. So I will once again leave the rest uh, to you. we will move on to the next part. So here's this interesting problem. So a kinetic sculpture, so meaning stuff that's on pulleys and uh, in fact this is a, a basically an Atwood machine and so uh, you should get something uh, when you f find the speed if you get a formula that reminds you of what's in the textbook about an Atwood machine then you've done something correctly. Um, and so here's a situation. There is a sculpture that, there's two pieces of the sculpture, one heavier than the other, um, uh, on wires over a big tube. That's why it's basically an Atwood machine. Uh, frictional force uh, are negligible. One is, the heavier thing is higher up than the other which means these things are gonna start moving when the, whatever, when it's released. And um, uh, one will eventually hit the floor. You know, will the floor be damaged based on the speed of the object? So we wanna know what's gonna be the speed of this object uh, when it all happens. And so, I'll try to draw a little picture here. So capital M for big mass, a little m for little mass, all right? And both are off of the floor. And so since M is greater than M, we know that uh, there will be motion, okay? And that acceleration will be, uh, or at least on the big one, will be be heading down to the ground. So we know this one's gonna go up or down and then this one's gonna go up. That's, so that's our, our picture of the uh, situation here. So now that we have a, a thing here, we can say, you know what, initially, before the mechanism releases these things to go, what's in my energy pie? And since nothing is moving, it's all gravitational potential energy. I have the gravitational potential energy of the little mass and the gravitational potential energy of the big mass. All right. And in the end of this thing, the final situation, both objects are going to be moving. So uh, you want to, when you do energy balances, you know, the end state is something, one of them's not moving. Both of them not moving. Of course, there's nothing to measure there. So you're wanting that split second before motion stops so that you have something to measure, something to compute here. And so if one of them, if both are moving, but one of them is essentially a hair's breadth uh, above the ground, then that means one of them has, uh, still has a gravitational potential energy. And so I have three things going on here. I have the kinetic energy of the little mass, I have the kinetic energy of the big mass, and then I'll have the gravitational potential of the little mass again, because it will rise higher. It will have a non-zero gravitational potential energy, whereas uh, this other one, so, you know, M will be here, and that one will be there. That'll be our uh, situation. So now we have a complete pie chart budget, energy pie chart budget. We know the gazentas on the left and the gazatas on the right, the ins and the outs of energy. And so that means I can write an energy balance because I've accounted for the transfer of energy. What was it in, what did we have initially? What will we have finally? And so we can start writing equation. Potential use of Gs, mass, uh, uh, Potential energy of the gravity is always the same kind of equation. It's an MGH, a mass gravity height equation. But since I use little m for one of them and big 
m for the other. I'm also going to have a different height. Okay, so we would, um, you know, this this thing here is at a big height h, and this one's here at a little height h. You know, for this initial condition, and all of that energy gets transferred into motion, uh, and but I'm going to deal with the gravitational potential first. So this uh, little m starts off at h and is going to move, starts off at little h, and is going to move capital H. So I have an h plus big H situation going on in the final situation, the, the final scenario, final end game of this thing. And then I have the two kinetic energies. I'll have m v squared, little m v squared, and big M v squared. So we have, let's see here. So we've accounted for all the stuff in our pie chart, and it wants to know the speed before it hits the floor. And we have more than enough information uh, to do that. Next problem, another kinetic sculpture problem here, except this one is a bit simpler. Um, a machine's going to pull something up on a, a row, it's hanging, Vertically, a machine's going to pull it uh, up at an angle, and then how much? So, how much energy does it take to do that? And so, the idea of destruction is if this thing lets loose, then it's going to slam into the wall or something like that. Okay, so we sort of need to have a picture of what's going on. So, let's see here. So here's our mass, our thing that's hanging um, on some length of rope L, okay? So it'll have some sort of tension in that wire due to its weight uh, in that regard. And then this machine's going to lift it up horizontally. So it'll have a, uh, um, a little bit of an arc that will be on its um, thing there. And so, but we still have that rope that it's on. So it went through some angle. So this is the machine has um, pulled, has pulled on it horizontally, which lifts it up uh, uh, at this angle. So it has the ability to, I guess, itself rise. So we don't really care about that. Just this is the setup of the problem. So we now have pictured the, I guess, the uh, initial and final states. The final state where it's lifted. And it's had a change in height. Uh, of some amount. So this has been shown a couple of times um, in that we have two triangles, we have a triangle that we could uh, pay attention to here. And so I'm going to kind of zero in on this right here we need to uh, understand what's going on in this uh, piece of the puzzle. So cosine theta will let me address the two sides of this situation. So what I have here is I have in the green triangle, I have the length of the rope shortened by that change in height 
over its original length, okay? And so L cos and theta is L minus delta H, and that means you can get delta H is L minus L cos and theta, which we're gonna need because the only kind of energy we're dealing with in this situation, there's just gravitational potential energy. And the energy, which we could just call E, is going to be that gravitational potential energy, which I'm not going to write the equation for because you've written it a bunch of times in your notes and I've written it several times today already. And so this is uh, a relatively simple problem, but you need to understand that trig, which shows up frequently, this particular uh, scenario, this, um, the fact that you can get a change in height will always be that kind of uh, trigonometric uh, maneuver is pretty common in real machines. All right. All right. One. I think this is, uh, we have two more. Yeah, we have two more. So the ski launch problem. So we have a ski ramp, and so, so they'll go down the ramp, it's probably curved a little bit better than I wrote it, and, whoosh, and they go off uh, the ramp here at some speed, which I think in this one is, uh, oh wait a minute, I got, uh, I got my screens backwards. I'm looking at my notes for uh, one and doing the other here. So let me get back to the one that's here. That's weird. I wonder why they got switched around. All right, so the bungee jump into a big old thing of jello. So the Dean uh, hanging by an ankle, bungee cord. And so there's some pieces of this puzzle here where energy is being transferred, stored, etc. If you don't draw a picture, you are bound to miss the boat so it's there's a height that everything starts off there is a portion of the height that's just free fall then there's a portion where there's stretch in the bungee cord and then there's the the height of the person so that their head just you know barely touches or doesn't touch the jello and according to this problem this jello pool is 1.7 meters no, 1.4 meters deep or tall, if you will. So we have that. We have the height. We could say the height of the Dean is 1.7 meters, according to the problem. There's a stretch, which we like to call X, but we don't know what the stretch is. In fact, we don't even need to determine how much stretch we need to determine what bungee cord to buy, what is its spring constant. And then there's some uh, length of free fall, which I think was 30 meters, yes. All right, and so we have um, this set up here. So we've labeled some critical pieces of the puzzle. And it is also the case, we know that this part, this is a, a total height, so I'll use a, a capital H in this case, of 44 meters. And so for a problem that has this many transitions in it, you would want to, um, you know, get a decent picture 
Uh, this is better than merely listing things because if you list, then you'll be equation hunting and you're likely to not understand uh, the situation. Um, and so what may not be obvious is why we don't need to compute the stretch. And that's because this height is also the sum of things that are known other than the stretch itself. And so I can write the stretch in terms of known things. Okay, so I guess we could compute the stretch. It's just trivial in this regard. Um, um, but this that's the situation. So now we have, we've drawn a good picture. We've listed all the details. We've taken all of the easy kills, so to speak, in the problem. And so what happens? So there's all this gravitational potential energy, okay, that goes into spring energy. That's all that happens in this problem. There's nothing else happening in the problem, just this, okay? So, um, but what is the gravitational potential? Because I have three different chunks of height, which all can be described as that H amount. And so you have uh, MGH plus this, that's what's in the system. So I can just kind of leave that, you know, what do we mean by that? And then the spring energy, we know it's one half kx squared. And we have a, a version of x, which we, we could compute the number. Uh, we usually try to save computations until the end, you know, deal with it symbolically. And guess what's true at the end? Is the same thing. At the end of this uh, situation, we still have that energy stored in the system. All right, so you can take it from there. Um, and that's the setup. All right, now, one that I had my pages backwards with. So here we have a situation like this whether it be some sort of ramp, at the very end it curves and off. So there's initial velocity at the top of uh, this ramp, which I think was two meters per second. And then down here it's 76 kilometers per hour, which I think is roughly 21.1 meters per second if memory serves me well. This is some height h, that, and that's the goal of the problem, is, is what's the height of this thing. And there's this angle that it's at. For most of it is a, uh, a straight line, so we can have an angle for uh, this triangle that at the very end smooths out a little bit. Uh, it also may not, it may just go straight off, because I think sometimes they arrange the hills you know, so that it's everything's downhill, including the jump, okay? Um, and so you, you, you make it work. Um, so we have a, a decent picture here. There's this length over which the skier skis, and the reason why this is important is because there is kinetic friction. There's also static friction, just doesn't matter because in this situation it's moving. It's kind of, it starts off moving, it ends moving. So we don't care about static friction. We only care about um, that. And so what is what happens in this situation? Well, you have 
kinetic energy and uh, uh, work done by gravity and you have work done by friction and that ends up with a final kinetic energy. You could also reason that the work done by gravity and the work done by friction equals the change in kinetic energy, which is just a, a rearrangement if mathematically, or you could have started uh, with this. Depends on how you think about the world, all right? And so uh, you have the energy balance, all right? We already know, you know, work done by gravity is always a particular kind of thing, uh, equation. Kinetic energies are always a particular kind of equation form, but work done by friction, okay? Uh, let me... Work is always a force times distance game. In this case, we like to use little f for friction. The distance over which that friction uh, works, you know, is the, is the length of the ramp. And so we need uh, a way to uh, deal with that piece of the puzzle. Now, we don't know height, all right? So, you know, we know that this is MGH, and we want to uh, uh, solve for that, but we don't know H. We know something about the angle in L. So you're gonna need to um, uh, do some rearranging of things uh, so that H uh, makes it into, um, or, or we don't know length, rather. So we need to get rid of that L. So you need to use some trick to get rid of that L, all right? And that is a wrap for the setup for this celebration of knowledge that you need to get done this week.